Hi, I'm Jerry Boyer. I want to thank you for joining us. Um, today, we're having a discussion that I've been looking forward to and excited about for so long with Professor Vernon Smith from Chapman University, where he teaches, he teaches economics. Uh, that doesn't even begin to capture his career. Um, he is widely considered the founder of experimental economics, for which he was awarded the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences in 2002. He's written a shelf of books. He is a polymath, everything from quantum physics to neurobiology, and yes, some economics along the line, and theology. Um, recently, he's uh, written, now I don't have the hard copy, I'm a Kindle person, The Evidence of Things Not Seen, based on a lecture that he gave at Acton, um, at the Acton Institute, and he's our guest today. Professor Smith, thank you so much for being with us. Jerry, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to it. Well, just as we were chatting before, you mentioned the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. The title of your address is adapted from that. Uh, tell us how you are using this, this idea in the book of Hebrews, the evidence of substance of things, faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not well, seen. How does that inform you? Well, Hebrews 11.1, basically defines faith. Faith, it's, it says, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I see that uh, as applying directly to science as well as religion, because science very much in, involves leaps of the imagination and the creation of theories and structures. Uh, that one hopes are valid, that they, they, they capture some aspect of truth. And then one goes to evidence. Well, so much of the evidence in science, the evidence in science is not direct, it's indirect. And we don't actually see literally the, you know, the objects of our, of our study. And let me, let me give you uh, uh, an example of this. One of my Caltech professors uh, was Carl Anderson. And Anderson won the Nobel Prize for discovering the positron. If you look it up, it'll say he discovered the positron. Well, he did no such thing. <laughs> look at what he actually did. Uh, professor Addison, uh, Anderson, uh, uh, was it was looking at particles that, that he was generating that that entered in a cloud chamber hmm. and he's observing what happens in this cloud chamber and what he sees is the trace of a charged particle and that's just simply that the trace is some is some droplets of water you see that hmm. stand out in that cloud chamber and uh, it looks like the trace of an electron, except in the magnetic field, its curvature is, is wrong. In other words, it's curving in precisely the opposite direction that, it's, that it would curve if it's, a, if it's an electron. So hmm. he said, this is, this is a positron. And, and so he, in other words, what, what is he doing? He's, he's inferring that what he sees uh, is a positron because its characteristics, you see, fit the theory. And, and the theory is, you know, it, it's not, it's not, uh, theories are, are really uh, consistent with all observations, but consistent enough, you see, that it's, it's, it's believable. And I, in other words, your faith in that theory is being reinforced. But you see, it's, uh, Discovering the positron is really about cloud chambers and magnetic fields and making an inference, you see, based upon one's uh, comprehension of, of what, what these particles, how they behave and what, and what they, their characteristics are. So it's very much a, you, you see, and, and, and that's a leap, it's a leap of faith. Yes. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not apodictic certainty. No one has seen a positron. Well, maybe angels see them or God sees them, but no human being has ever yeah, seen yeah. a positron. They're too small, right? Right. right. 
And even, even if you came up with some different sort of image of the positron and this, and this indirect trace in the cloud chain, you see that you would say is something somehow closer to it, you're, you're still looking at that uh, phenomena through instruments. Hmm. You see, science uses instruments to leverage their observation. And then, so you're, you're constantly interpreting what the signals mean that are coming in those, in those instruments. So it, it, we're very much talking about evidence not seen. Hmm. <laughs> oh. we, we believe so in electrons, no one's seen an electron. We believe in a positrons, no one's seen a positron. So we believe in right. things like Hebrew says, not seen. And, exactly. yet when, and yet when scientism runs into religion, it, it, you know, it scoffs at the idea that we would believe well, in things yes. not seen, but they're believing in things not seen all the time. Right. And now, of course, the ancients, uh, their science was much closer to their religion in the sense it seemed, everything seemed like it was mysterious. Uh, for example, clouds were mysterious uh, a phenomena. They would appear suddenly in, in the atmosphere and go away and this sort of thing. And uh, well, now, you see, what does science today say about clouds? Well, it's a, it's a precipitate of, of water in the atmosphere. And, and it varied, that uh, clouds formation depends upon temperature and pressure. In other words, we can describe the engineering, how it works. But ask yourself, is it any less mysterious? Hmm. <laughs> you see th th that that the observable world obeys these laws that we've discovered, you see, doesn't really uh, do away with the mystery of it. It's just as mysterious today as it was to the ancients, even though we have a, a much better to, to describe, much better way of describing uh, the phenomena in terms of how it works. See, science is very much concerned with how things work. And and that leads to, to all kinds of new understanding that enables us to invent things and create things out of that, out of that un understanding. Uh, but the mystery of, is still there, the mystery of existence, that all of this, all of these laws, you see, amount to order hmm. and order everywhere uh, through the universe. And in there's order in science, there's order in our neighborhoods, communities, through our our friendships and mm. and and this sort of thing. So that the uh, order is in a sense the central thing that we that we experience and that we study as human beings. I'm reminded of an essay by. Um... Eugene Wigner, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences, or some title like that. And yes. he's, he's asking the question, why does our math work? I mean, we, we create our math in our head using deductive logic, and then we go out and describe the law of gravitation or cloud formation or positrons. He wasn't thinking about positrons yet. And it works. It shouldn't, in some sense, it shouldn't work unless, Wig Wigner says, suggests that, well, if the creator of my mind is also the creator of the world, then there's a commonality, which means the world should be able to be describable by, by, by my categories of mathematics, logic, cause, and effect. Oh, yes, I love that. It, and, and it's true, I think, in, in theory construction and the use of mathematics, we somehow, our minds have access to a bigger space than we live in, you see. And these flights of the imagination that we try to make coherent Mathematically, you ask, well, now what? What are the impl what's the implications of this theory, and are are any of these implications testable? Hmm. Can we confront uh, those implications with evidence? So that's the way science uh, science proceeds, and but 
But you know, this the, the substance of this hope for is up front in terms of our of, of our imagination and and our our create our mental creations. And then these there's these indirect observations where we and, and you know the experiments are just geniuses at coming up and finding ways you see of indirectly hmm. uh, testing a lot of these hypotheses. Is it fair to so, say that in the realm of say theology, there is an open understanding and acknowledgement that there's a belief in things not seen? But in the world of science, at least scientism, there is an attempt to sweep under the rug um, the 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 degree to which faith is needed. That both the, that religion and science both need faith. Religion is upfront about that. Science <laughs> tends to kind of not be quite so, or at least scientism tends to be not quite so upfront about it. No, I, I agree with that. It's the, the the rhetoric of materialism is still a vibrant in, in science, even though I think it's total. Science is, itself has made materialism obsolete. Hmm. You know, the idea that, that we can reduce everything to some substance, some uh, ultimate uh, uh, miniature substance that we can then kind of reconstruct everything. And that reductionist, uh, uh, idea that that drives materialism is just not. I mean, science itself. I think people, all kinds of scientists, recognize that that's an, an, an inadequate description. You see, of the reality they faced, and hmm. and 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 the 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 truth you see, which we pursue, is is. It's always uh, d- dependent upon these constructs, and the and this and, and this in, it involves invisible realities. You see, and you already you had it big time with Newton because, well, you know, Newton absolute what he did was astounding. He said that the motion of all of uh, matter is governed by gravity. What's gravity? Well. He can't tell you what gravity is. We know it by, he's, he, he, the implication is we know gravity by the effect it has. Yes. So that's an invisible reality, you see, but it has an effect on things. Force that. at a distance. And, I, I think in his correspondence, Leibniz criticized Isaac Newton. He said, well, you have described the mathematics of gravity, but you haven't described what gravity is. Yeah, I mean, basically, you're just putting the question off. It's just God. You know, I mean, God is just doing things. And, and Newton basically said, yes, it's God. Yeah. I'm just it's describing the mathematics of the way God has constructed the world. But but yes, there is an unseen element. How can there be force at a distance? There is. Yeah. My math can describe it. So then we, so Isaac Newton, essentially, he owned owned his faith. He said, yes, um, this is this yeah. is God. Absolutely yes, and and it, and it, and and of course his one error in a sense was to assume that that uh, electromagnetic radiation had an infinite velocity. It was instantaneous. Mm. That light we see from the sun was derives instantaneously as it leaves. Well, we now know that it takes about eight, well, it's something like eight and a half minutes, I think, for the light from the sun to reach our eyes. And, and of course, that has incredible implications because that means uh, we have to take that into account and in all in adjusting all of our data, you'll mm-hmm. say. And, and of course, that, and that led Einstein to, you know, the theory of relativity. And, you know, his great 1905 papers, there's about three or four of them. One of them was Nobel Prize material. And that was the one that really created quantum mechanics. You'll see it wasn't relativity theory. Uh, although that was easily of that uh, of that stature. Uh, so Einstein, you see, moved the invisible realities even even further along and and indeed led when 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 Hubble and 
uh, was able to establish the notion that the, that the universe is expanding, you see, that was very hard for scientists to take because it, people had always just assumed that, you know, the universe had already always existed. And there was a lot of resistance mm -hmm. to, to the notion of an origin, even though that's already in Genesis, right? Right. <laughs> the, you know, the, uh, Genesis uh, is consistent with the Big Bang Theory. Yes. And, and Maybe and, that's why there, I think Hoyle suggested kind of admitted that maybe the resistance to the Big Bang Theory and to the expansionary universe was, in fact, a desire to avoid the conclusion <laughs> that, 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 that this is described in Genesis. In other words, they kind of cut, they cut themselves off from the empirical data to some degree because they didn't want it to lead back to, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, yes, and that raises really embarrassing questions. If there was a beginning, what was there before the beginning? Why was there a beginning? If there's a beginning, then maybe there's an end. Why is, would there be an end? You see, all of these things became, eventually became part, of course, what science has studied. But there was a lot of resistance to that at first. And there's, there's of course, there's the, just the paradox of the idea that science likes to use, say, mathematical laws uh, and the laws of science. But those laws are not themselves physical. They are ideas. Right. There are law, the laws of math. You can't eat the quadratic equation. Um, you, you might be able to use it to triangulate yeah, yeah. something, but it's 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 an idea. It's it's not material. And yet the material world follows it. And then you ask some of these materialists, well, when did these laws of mathematics come into existence? Well, well, they, in the beginning of the universe. Well, wait a minute. How could a universe begin Unless there's laws of mathematics, how can there be something? Well, there could be yeah, chaos right. maybe in the beginning. So there's got, and then they come up with the idea of Hilbert space, which is a, a zone of mathematical laws that has no physicality. Well, okay. Somebody's thinking <laughs> math before the universe exists. And that person is convenient to call God, isn't he? Oh, yes. Yes. And I think that, well, you know, one of my, uh, interest in economics has, has been to, uh, in classical economics, and particularly the contributions of Adam Smith. And of course, Adam Smith is very well known for the wealth of nations, much less well known for the theory of moral sentiments. Mm. And the theory of moral sentiments is, is really a model of the order we find in our uh, communities of neighbor, of families, extended families, friends, and neighbors. You see, it's really about, he, he, Smith observed huge amount of order, you see, in our day-to-day -day relationships. And asked, well, where does this come from, you see, and what's, what's the basis for this? And, and he, now Adam Smith clearly saw the origin of all order in God, mm. you know, what he calls the great author of nature. That one, he's got many different words that he uses, including God. And, but interesting, and, and he saw these things are coming, actually they come from our religious beliefs, but he says that doesn't really explain them because the question is how do how do humans become uh, aware, you see, of this order? How how do humans learn to follow rules that produce order? So that was his challenge, and he didn't see religion as as providing an explanation of that, but just simply the source of morality and and beliefs that that somehow then became a reality through through our experience. So it's interesting that he, although he believed in God, saw that as the source of all order, there's still this, this job we have to do to ask how humans, uh, how does it, how do humans learn rules on the ground and, and experientially that, that uh, if followed ideally, help to really implement faith and, and religious belief. Hmm. 
So it's, it's interesting that he, he saw, and, and, and in economics, you know, what are, what are, what's the, there's a huge amount of order in the economy and it has this capacity to create wealth quite unintentionally in terms of each person out there doing, trying to do best for himself. Turns out under the right rules, he does, we do best for everybody. Yes. <laughs> And and that and and of course th- that's what showed up in my first market market experiments when I started doing experiments. They were market experiments, and I was astounded and that how, naive, and how quickly people reached how naive undergraduates could find the equilibrium in these markets. Nothing to it, right. with it a few iterations, and and that was no one in that went to graduate school with, with me, middle of the 20th century, would have believed that that would be possible. Everyone taught that you only had equilibrium when you had perfect knowledge. Yeah, people right. had to have perfect and complete information. Oh, and everybody has to be a large number of buyers and sellers. Right. Everybody has to be very tiny relative to the total. All of that stuff is irrelevant. Give me eight or 10 undergraduates, and I uh, motivate half of them or some of them as buyers to, and give them values and, and, they're, and they make money by buying low. I give sellers costs and they make money by selling high. <laughs> and then we, get, we give them rules for trading. You see, we use, uh, we use uh, rules like in the com- commodity double, markets double in auctions, Chicago. Right. Yeah, double auction. And... And most of the, when I first started doing the experiments, no one would have seen a double auction. Hmm. But guess what? They pick up it very quickly. They get it. They get right into it. And pretty soon they're fi- they find the equilibrium. It's almost <laughs> like we're designed to barter and truck, as, as exactly. uh, your namesake said. Um, yes. So this kind of reminds me, it's it's fascinating reading your work or listening to your lectures. You're very epistemological for an economist. You know, there's a lot of discussion about theory of knowledge. And if, if I'm seeing a commonality here, it is that we humans have more capacity for knowledge, that there's an ability to get to get over that knowledge gap more easily than we think. Mm-hmm. Right. So that intuition works better than we think. Markets work better than we think. Faith works better than we think. The insistence on perfect knowledge is a is a fatal conceit. The, uh, that the constructivism yes. doesn't work, and that we are more able to know than theory suggests we are able to know, which to me further suggests that we are built and de- and designed to know. Yes, I, that's absolutely. I quite agree with it. Very good. And and you know, I was was sort of pushed into these uh, theory of knowledge questions because uh, I had all these results in the lab and, and, and people were questioning, well, wait a minute, you know, because uh, of experiments, why are you doing I would explain, this is, I've discovered this is an incredible way to learn and test what it is you think you know. <laughs> and, and it was, and, and that, so that I, I had to justify my existence, I was pushed in, you see, to these kinds of questions. And I ended up reading, you know, I read Popper and, and, and my favorite is Lakatos. I, I just love his work. And but partly because he was both a, uh, he was a historian of science as well as a methodologist. And so he, I just love the way he links a lot of his ideas up with historical examples in, in science. And, and I was able to, to, to me, the experimental paradigm kind of fit in to, to his way of thinking. You mm-hmm. see, that's, that's, that's the reason why I was attracted to, to lactose. And so I, uh, and so I re- ended up writing some papers on methodology because it, it, it was important, I thought, for economists to understand that 
that our profession should be completely open to sources of evidence. Hmm. And and we should not think in, think in terms of, of just Department of Commerce of data or the Labor Department and that we should think of, of ways in which we obtain evidence where we control the circumstances under which the evidence is, is gathered. And it turned out that that was a winner in economics because it, uh, for one thing, it introduced the notion that you just don't do theory. You do theory that's, that, that you can show is testable and you find ways to, to confront it with evidence. And, and, we, and, what, and we need to modify theories in the light of evidence, that it's an ongoing thing, you know. <laughs> Truth is dynamic. <laughs> and that's, you, know. you, you mentioned Popper. That's, the, that's Popper's point, that the, yeah. d- that the most the data can do is disconfirm your hypothesis or your theory. Yeah. The data yes. can never establish your theory. There's still faith. Um, it can knock it down, but it can't permanently establish it. Yes. Hmm. And every, of course, every experiment is just a case, you see, and you can't generalize from a case. And you, what you do is do many cases, do a lot of variation, and your confidence in that theory, you see, improves as you get more and more of this evidence. Because and every maybe... every alternative hypothesis, I, I, I'm influenced a lot by Thomas Bayes, right? So there are mm-hmm. multiple ways, there are multiple paths to the observed data. Your theory is one of them, but another theory could be. But every oh, yeah. time every time you disconfirm a theory, you strengthen the probability of the theory that hasn't been disconfirmed. Does that does that make sense? Yes, yes, and I and I've argued it's very important to have more than one theory. Otherwise, you're just testing a theory against the void. And of course, it's gonna, it may look pretty good against the void. Yeah. All right. I'm so glad you said that because I find it very frustrating. Like I don't write for academic journals, uh, but I find it very frustrating that that has influenced science and economics to, to such a degree that almost all of our analysis is testing a theory against the null hypothesis. The yes. whole edifice of statistical significance, our mutual friend Deirdre McCloskey has written about the cult of statistical significance and the the magic yes. of the p value right um I know, I know. and and it's it it just gives away so much when every what you're, you're never testing your theory you're only testing the null hypothesis when what you really should be doing is testing theories against one another at least that's what it seems to me and you can and you invented a way to do that you can do an a b test with an experiment with your students. You can change yeah. a thing, change another thing, change another thing. And we can never do that with historic economic data. We can't download from SAC, fact set or, right? I mean, history is whatever it is. We can't run counterfactuals in history, but we can using your methodology. What, I mean, so, what yeah. an incredible breakthrough. Oh, yes. Well, it's just been incredible. It's fun. <laughs> hmm. You know, from the, my various... From my very first experiment, it's just been uh, uh, a life of fun. And, uh, you know, and I'm still learning, really. What are you learning right now? What, what's, what's, what's at your horizon oh, at this moment? Well, the thing that I have learned so much is, is the relevance of Adam Smith's model of human sociability. To modern, for example, uh, uh, trust games. Hmm. Uh, the ultimatum games are kind of less interesting, but but they're within this. Uh, see, pe- people in trust games show far more trust and trustworthiness in these two-person games than you can get out of the self-interest principle, and hmm. and, and so that has that has baffled us. And w- what a lot of the behavioral economists have done is simply said, well, we can explain that if I put your payoff as well as my payoff and my utility function. I asked, but how did it get there? Why? You didn't, you, you didn't, this is not predictive. This is an after effect. Uh, you see, you're, you're curve fitting. Yes. <laughs> You're, you're fitting the utility function, what you, what 
what you're finding in the laboratory, but but you, you were originally remember you were shocked to find this. Whatever happened and, must have had utility. It, Therefore, it all fits in the utility function. Yeah, yes. yeah. Well, you see, Adam Smith was not a utilitarian in this sense at all. Hmm. To Adam Smith and the theory of moral sentiments, everyone is strictly self-interested. But he says, you cannot look mankind in the face and avow that all your every decision is dri driven by your self-interest. So he distinguishes being self-interested from acting always in your self-interest. And that's a very important because you see now that that opens up the way to us becoming rule followers in, in which we use what Adam Smith calls self-command to make judgments about when and where to modify our actions in our self-interest in order to live peaceably with our neighbors. <laughs> so it, seem, it seems as though the, the distorted account of Adam Smith plays off self-interest against altruism, whereas the integrated Adam Smith Self-interest is the foundation of altruism. I have to know what a human being, I mean, I know getting punched in the nose hurts because if I get punched in the nose, it hurts. So I can't really be altruistic unless I've suffered or had pleasures, unless I know what it is to be a human being in the world and to know yes. what my other, what my self-interest is. Until then, I can't properly look out for somebody else's self-interest because they'd be a complete yeah. mystery to me otherwise. Yeah, you see, and, and the rules that we follow have to do with, there's two classes of rules. There's beneficence, hmm. what Adam Smith calls beneficence, and justice. These are the two pillars of society. Now, beneficence has to do with our, with the way we respond when people deliberately do something good for us. You see, it's intentional. He says, and he says, we feel an obligation to reward that. <laughs> so it's about good things being done. And, and the injustice just has to do with the obverse of that, where somebody does something that's hurtful to us and intended to do us do it. So we feel the need to, to punish that in response. Even among friends, friends that can happen, that this can happen with friends that they do things that they didn't intend. Well, they need to be uh, be reminded that that's that's hurtful. Perhaps, perhaps, even, perhaps even beyond the narrow confines of self-interest. In other words, we might pursue justice at cost to ourselves. Well, but, but think about though, yeah. if I'm tuned to respond in a reward way to actions deliberate actions uh, and to punish uh, deliberately hurtful actions, that means that I'm assuming everyone is self-interested. Yes. You see, how do you know that, how do you know that people benefit by a, pater a particular act? It's because you're assuming they're self-interested. Right. Otherwise, just, what sense would it make to punish someone for doing something bad? Unless yeah. you know that they're going to not like being punished. Yeah. yeah, right. So, so you see, self-interest and and common knowledge of self-interest is essential in implementing the rules that make us social. Yes, interesting. <laughs> and and I think this is brilliant. It's mm. ab. I mean, uh, this work here, here it is, written in 1759, and it says it's it's more relevant in my view to understanding these issues of, of human sociability today than, any, than anything comparable that, that we're now pursuing, you see, in the lab, in our, in, in our research. It's, uh, it organizes that data just really well. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't open questions. <laughs> people, for example, people don't always read each other very, uh, perfectly in these games. And so there's room for error. And you see that, but, but the point is his model is rich enough that you can vary payoffs to see how that, how that influences the, the, the outcome. It's rich enough that you know what to do if the model fails. <laughs> and, or, 
or one that fails. It's fascinating to see experimental empirical economics catching up with the insights of 200 and a quarter years ago. Um, yes. That the, the 20th century, there was a lot of theoretical, a lot of model, a lot of lines on chalkboards, a lot of physics envy, et cetera. Um, uh, and in some sense, you've helped. I mean, I think Smith was observing mainly. I mean, you know, he was working for the patent office. Oh. He was probably seeing a lot of commerce. So he wasn't starting out on a chalkboard. He was observing markets and then formulating theory based on that observation. Oh, he was an incredibly close observer. And he and in his and he's all he must have been constantly asking himself, now, why is that? Why are, why are people doing this? Why is this? Why do I observe this? Because his the theory of moral sentiments <clears throat> is hard reading. It was for me the first time. I keep going back and revisiting and rereading, and I the, and I always find new stuff. And partly, it's a matter of kind of learning to think like he did, and to be sensitive to ob observation. And he and he not only was interested in the details, but he's interested in big the big picture. You see, that's another phenomenon that's, that's, uh, that, that's amazing about Adam Smith. He was a big picture thinking thinker and at the same time, very concerned about detail. That's it. That's the rare gift of yes. genius to be able to integrate details into a big picture. Um, that's, that's very few people have that. And I think that really stands out. I also wonder, let, let me just take a little side tour here. To what degree is Adam Smith, you know, um, starting de novo, or there's there's people before him. There's Pufendorf, he's reading the Salamanca scholars, um, mm -hmm. where, and I don't know if you, how familiar we are with this story, but you know, these we have these theologians, the first free market economists were theologians in Salamanca, Spain. Oh yeah. Right, yes. okay. Yeah, because yeah, you're involved with the Acton Institute. But the thing that fascinates me so much about this is they didn't learn their economics by from direct observation, they didn't learn it by thinking. They learned it by getting letters from confessors. So some merchant would be out there, some Venetian merchant yes. would be out there tr bartering and trucking, trucking, right? And then he comes mm -hmm. back and says, forgive me, father, I sinned. Well, what did you do, my son? Well, I, I charged interest above and beyond the, the allowed rate. Well, why did you do that, my son? Well, to compensate me for the risk of all these new doubloons coming in from the new world. And yes. what's happening is little by little, these confessors are saying, well, that's a sin. Why'd you do it? And little by little, the merchants are educating the priests yes. on economics. And then the priests are writing letters to the university saying, now, why do we believe in just price again? And it's like coming up <laughs> from, from the bottom. And that's and basically, that's the, those are the first economists and Pufendorf reads them and you get Adam Smith and then later Menger reads them. But this thing, this thing starts mm -hmm. in the confessional booth in the 1400s, uh, where, where merchants yeah, are explaining very. to priests, don't give me too many Hail Marys. It really isn't so bad. I have a good reason for doing things the way I do. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it is very fascinating. Yeah. It's a little bit of the yes. meek inheriting. Okay. So um, you mentioned imperfect knowledge. Um, the one of the areas where you've done a lot of really interesting work is in the formation of bubbles. Um, yes. That because mm -hmm. that is in some sense a vulnerability. We're pretty good at discovering the right price when we are using the product right away, but yes. when you have other conditions, we get pretty bad at finding the right price. So, what are the preconditions of of market mis mis misvaluation of bubbles? The precondition is that the item that you're buying can be retraded. It's very simple. <laughs> and I didn't see that at first. The simplest stuff stuff can be the most difficult to, to finally digest. No, you see, about 75% of private product uh, is our consumer goods or services that, that can't be retraded. GDP. You don't You're talking buy, about GD, GDP. Yeah, you don't buy a hamburger to resell it. Yes. You don't get a haircut to resell it. Right. You don't buy an airplane seat to go from A to B to resell it or a hotel room. You see, these are these are all 
purchased for use, for consumption, and they disappear. You see, that uh, a, a hotel room not rented is lost forever if it's not filled, you see. And so uh, it's where goods, uh, the value of goods are, are in the, however it is that you utilize those goods. And all those sales are final, you see. Yes. That's a very large part of, of, of the goods in the markets. It, those markets, and you see my early experiments, were all of this character. I didn't make that distinction at the no, time. Oh, so there were no retradable goods? No, the, nothing was retradable. I no, I didn't do, until I did the asset trading experiments you're refer, referring to, and those were... Oh, let's see. These are 20 years, 25 years after the first experiments uh, of goods that couldn't be retraded. And so we we were aware, you see, that there's things like bubbles out there in the stock market. And I didn't know as much about housing then as I as I eventually learned. But we were aware of that. And we, and we thought, well, let's see if we can produce bubbles in the lab. And so the idea was, I said, let's begin with a baseline where it's just so transparent that people will trade. We can expect them to trade at fundamental value. And, and fundamental value was, was a dividend value, hmm. you see. So there's a, there's a distribution of dividends. Let's see, 0, 8, 28, 60. I think the first, one of my first experiments, there was a four-point distribution and the expected value, mathematically expected value, was 24 cents. So we explained to the subjects, you're going to you're, you've got an endowment of cash and shares. You're going to trade for 15 periods. At the end of each period, there'll be a draw from this dividend distribution. And notice that the, the average value is 24 cents. Well, that means in the first period, you're trading something that's looking forward to 15 draws. Mm -hmm. So what's the holding value? It's 15 times 24 cents. Mm -hmm. So what we tell the subjects is that's $3.60. So they have they have perfect knowledge, like in the textbooks. Uh, we're, we're, we're not only giving them information, we're being very sure that they, that they understand what that means, the implications. And what do we observe? bubbles. <laughs> they don't trade near. So you have declining fundamental value. It starts out at 360, 360 then it falls to what, 324 or whatever. And it comes down. And the last period, it's 24 cents because there's this one draw left. So we describe all that. They pay no attention to it. It starts out trading below fundamental value, goes up period by period, goes through the declining fundamental value, peaks out and crashes sometime, oh, two, three, or four periods before the end. Fascinating. And we just were, we were baffled by this. There was no attention to what we said, what we're telling them. They're doing what they want to do. So then we bring them back a second time and a third time, put them in the same experiment, and now they finally get it. In other words, they learn by experience, not by these abstract uh, representations. They get to the equilibrium, but the thing is, it takes three. <laughs> it takes three different times, which and means that, that people who haven't lived through at least two bubbles, um, yeah. and I'm talking now in the real world, not the experiment, yes. right? If someone hasn't yes. lived through a few bubbles, they're likely to be very error prone when it comes to assigning value to right. retradable assets like stocks or bonds. Yes, and starting in 1997 and peaking out in, let me see the. I think it was the first quarter of 2006, if I recall correctly, you had uh, an increase in the average value of homes yes. in the United States uh, far greater than uh, all other prices. If you have inflation adjusts that, it, it's uh, homes rose by something like 85% more than the general price level. If you compare it with home rentals, same thing, rising relative to the rental. And this is, you see, but, but think about a home. It has 
that now has two values. It has a value in, for shelter and you live in it for, and you consume that, but it also has a value to, to resell it. And the thing is, those two values can get disconnected hmm. and separated. And it very much depends upon the inflow of mortgage credit. You see, now you get into government policy and, and bank policy. So another precondition, tradable, retradable goods and another maybe helper in bubble formation is easily available money, whether yes. it's credit or money supply creation, increased increased demand in the form of monetary stimulus of one form or another. Yes. And of course, people buy homes with mostly other people's money. Hmm. You buy them for 15 or 20 percent down. Uh, and, and, and of course, during our bubble leading up to the Great Recession, actually, the, you had nothing. You didn't have to put anything down. <laughs> I, I mean, we got to the point ninja where loans. yes, yes. And well, how long are you going? To, how long can you keep that up? You see, prices can't go on forever. There's going to be a day of reckoning. And uh, Adam Smith had a phrase. He said, "Too much of other people's money." <laughs> That apply. He didn't have in mind the housing market. He was talking about the South Sea uh, bubble and the South Sea company. And, and he saw the problem there is that there, were, there was too much in that. And the managers there had too much of other people's money invested. And they, they weren't as motivated to carefully watch over it as if it would have been their own. Okay. So had the, he had this notion... Other people's yes. opium addiction, right? Um, opium, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, but, but anyway, it applies perfectly to the modern day. Uh, modern well, and that, that, that brings in another interesting factor, which is do you have agency risk? Because when you have, when somebody's spending other people's money, then there is a separation, um, you know, between the, 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 oh, yeah. the consequences, I mean, who, uh, who, who gets the consequences and who makes the decisions. Well, and, and look what we did. We bailed out the big banks. You see, you know, Sheila Bear was over at the FDIC. She presided over a, a number of bankruptcies of small to medium-sized banks at no cost to the taxpayer. All of those, the equity plus the prepaid insurance was enough to cover, you see, the, uh, the deposits so that depositors didn't lose their money. And as she said it, I never saw any good evidence that the big banks were not capable of covering it too. But you see that what we did with the large banks was simply bail out the stockholders. We weren't bailing out the depositors. Yes. And, it, and, that, and people, didn't, <laughs> people didn't, later they, they, they realized what had happened. Uh, <clears throat> And but that was that was really a uh, talk about sin. <laughs> well, it's an e it's a economic redistribution upwards. Uh, we can argue yes, about yes. whether government should redistribute downwards, um, whether, yes. it should, whether it should redistribute at all. But it seems yes. to me the least defensible form of redistribution is the upwards redistribution. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, I was, I'm it, you mentioned that was something like two thirds of GDP are the, are the non-retradable goods. And yes, I was thinking yes. about um, our friend, Mark Skousen and gross output. Yes. Um, be, because you, you argue in one of your lectures that because of that, because we don't have hamburger bubbles, right? Mm -hmm. We have housing bubbles, but not hamburger bubbles, um, that, that consumers are a sort of flywheel which stabilizes the economy. You don't have wide, yeah, yes. right, okay. Um, so then if you look at gross output, which adds the stages before GDP, mm -hmm. which are largely retradable because they're the supply chain. Yes. Yeah. Bauxite to aluminum to component to automobile yeah. mm -hmm. to dealer, right? Yes, you yes. actually have a lot. It's not a flywheel. Gross output is far more variable than uh, GDP yeah. because of the because it has almost all retradable goods, whereas GDP is almost all non-retradable goods. At least that's I'm I'm just thinking yeah. out loud. Is that making any sense to you? Oh, you're thinking out loud correctly. 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's exactly the thing, the way to think about it. If it's retradable, it is subject to the possibility of, of all sorts of instability. I, I would say literally that all the stability in the economy comes from these uh, two thirds of the GDP that can't be retraded. Hmm. And 75% of private product, because I think of that as GDP minus government. So whether you think of it as two thirds of GDP or 75% of private product, that's where stability comes from. And in the typical recession, you see uh, those consumption items hold up very well, even in recessions. It may, it may stop rising as fast and in really bad recessions like the Great Depression or the Great Recession, it may turn down some, but it still holds up and, and is the great, you know, the great flywheel that gives inertia to the economy and, and, and helps it uh, stay uh, even keel. Hmm. And I think if, if go, if this is involving, you see those supply chains and retradable goods along the way, then they, they can wave. That supply chain can be a waving chain, perhaps because of little mini uh, uh, incongruencies, you'll see, because people are not, uh, you see, rational expectations theory says that we should see that retradable value as no different than use value. But in fact, it is seen as different. And it becomes, a, it, it can become a separate uh, motivation. So you have people buying homes because they think they undervalue because they want to resell them rather than live in them. So that can become a way, you see, uh, uh, a, a motivation for, for, your, uh, for your activity in those, in those markets. Well, the knowledge is more limited, right? I know exactly how much I like a Big Mac. I don't know exactly how much 10 years from now someone's going to like the house that I bought and try to sell to them. So that future yeah. orientation and anticipating the feelings of another add two huge elements of uncertainty. Yes. Does that make any sense? No, it does. And I think I think it's going to be interesting to follow these markets coming out, out of the, uh, of, of the uh, COVID-19 uh, interlude. Because, you know, but people have been living in their homes. I would think, if anything, they see them as more valuable than ever. They, you know, homes protected people. And it was a, it was a place where you could, and, and look what people did sitting in their homes. They did a lot of repairs. Mm -hmm. So the, <laughs> heavens, two befores at $8 a piece. We've had this really big run up, you see, in lumber prices because it's coming from Home Depot and, and uh, uh, all of these home improvement guys and, and, and also automobile parts. People must be fixing their cars. Well, that's interesting. I was thinking of this mainly as a monetary excess money creation, like so, a, a inflation phenomenon. But you're suggesting that there's a social shift going on here with a lot of home repairs. Um, and that's one of the drivers of, of like, say, lumber prices. Yeah, right. They're, 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 they're sitting at home and they're realizing, you know, I've been putting off doing such and such on this house. I'm going to do it now. And, and so we had an incredible boom, you see, in, in, uh, in kind of home, home improvement materials. Fascinating. Uh, paint all this sort of thing and and automobile parts did well and it's it's you know pe people uh they it, it, if you're not working out there there's all kinds of stuff you can do working for yourself in terms of maintenance and repairs and this sort of thing it's interesting that people stuck in their homes that's what they did and if it's illegal to go out there then you're still you still have that tendency to truck and barter and produce because that's the way we're created so yes. you, uh, we're, we're gardening more than we used to, Susan and I. We, we've done a lot with the gardening in the patio and in the, in the house. And people are doing more physical fitness as well. They, we see these Peloton commercials and everything. I mean, these, the mm -hmm. home fitness things are exploding. So that's fascinating. Yes. Well, you've been so generous with your time. I hope we can do this again. There, there's so, because we barely scratched the surface of things well, that yeah. you have to say. So I hope you'd be willing to come back and talk about 
some of this again. Okay. Is there, is, is there anything that I didn't ask you that you want to cover or anything? I, I don't want this to end without you having an, an opportunity to speak. Oh, no, to I'm anyone. happy. I think, I think you've mentioned, I think the, uh, the, the asset trading, which came, which came about in the lab about 25 years after the first market experiments. And the bubbles phenomena was as shocking to us as to me as the original market experiments, because I thought this I'd created such a simple environment, it would be transparent. Well, it was not transparent. And people were motivated. You see, we had these, we call them momentum elements that were just homegrown in these, in these laboratory uh, markets. And although, the, and they eventually disappear, you just bring them back and, and experientially it disappears. People are not stupid, you know, they're, they well, learn. They start, well, they start out a little stupid maybe, but they learn from the pain. Well, yeah. that's an important yeah. point, you know, back to a biblical theme, wisdom comes through suffering. Yes. And that's, I think that's the most important thing about the laboratory experiments in economics is that people learn by experience. They don't learn by kind of abstract thinking. And that's the problem with the economists have theories. And I think, and I, I'm not discouraging that, but we need better models of our agents. Hmm. You see, we, we tend to model uh, an ideal agent, optimizing agent that we've created in our mind. Adam Smith didn't do that. Uh, Jerry, read chapter seven of The Wealth of Nations. He's describing how buyers and sellers find prices in the market. And he's thinking about the, how the buyers and sellers uh, influence each other. He's, he's thinking about a group, you see. And he doesn't put it this. See, a modern version is what those buyers and sellers are doing is finding the a price that's information to the rest of the world that enables people to make better decisions. Hmm. But so it's, and that's not the notion of prices as, as information is not explicit in Adam Smith, but it's implicit. It's all there. And, and his models, you see, far better than any of the neoclassical models of his model of price discovery because he's thinking about the agents and what they're doing and how price comes out of their haggling and bargaining. Uh, it's beautiful. He's uh, thinking about people as real people, not as little, yes. not as little irreducible atoms driven exactly. about by, by vectors. Yes. Hmm. Well, I've enjoyed this a great deal. Um, we've been talking with Professor Vernon Smith from, uh, from Chapman University. Um, I, I, if you want to start someplace, there's so many places to start, but I really enjoyed the book, The, um, uh, the Evidence of Things Not Seen, um, I, and that's uh, the lecture at Acton. And I'll put a link on the column for this so people can uh, find that book. And I will, yeah. go, I will go reread Adam Smith, Chapter 7, um, okay. to look for what you mentioned. Thank you so much, Professor Smith, for being with us. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. It's been fun. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.